This episode of Road to Apex is sponsored by Pengrade One. Previously on Road to Apex. We're outside Kearney Classic Car Collection Museum. This is a 1919 Chevrolet. This is what would have been typical in the early days of the Lincoln Highway. A lot of you may wonder, why did I just select 91? What is the difference? This is the original path as well, the Lincoln Highway, coming through Elkhorn, Nebraska right now. I'm just excited to be able to drive it. President Lincoln decided that we were going to try to have a transcontinental railroad. Trains could stop if they had in smaller towns, but they don't do it like we do today. Another leg today on the Lincoln Highway. We're just outside Cheyenne right now, and you'll notice I'm dressed a little bit more comfortable than usual, as the more west we have head, the hotter it's gotten. So keep that in mind. Even though I have a great air conditioning system provided by Transtar, that's working fine. You make a lot of stops along the Lincoln Highway, you're out of the car, and that's the goal, right? You know, again, sometimes the journey is the destination, and that's how it is on the Lincoln Highway. So today what we're going to be following is a lot of the Overland Trail that was established by Jim Bridger in 1862. And that's the kind of the path that Lincoln Highway is going to follow. The elevation will continue to climb as we head towards Salt Lake City. A lot of things to see today, a lot of things to do. Excited to hit the road. Stay tuned. might be the ninth largest state in the union, but it's also the least populated per square mile. Rather interesting. But Wyoming is very important to the union. It was the first state that allowed women to vote. And right behind me is the Cheyenne train depot. Very important part of our movement from east to west. You can almost imagine what she would have looked like coming off the train dressed like that. Trains, whistles blowing in the background, goods coming in, cattle arriving, people arriving from the east to the west, allowing that expansion west. Cheyenne was at the heart of that, and the Lincoln Highway eventually joined the railroad in Cheyenne, allowing more people in. A lot of the towns that were established on the railroad kind of fizzled out. The Cheyenne stayed, and it's a great testament to the Lincoln Highway and the rail station as well. Today's technicians look to the aftermarket for quality parts so they can turn their bays and get their customers back on the road. BCA Bearings by NTN provides OE quality wheel hubs, bearings, and seals to ensure that when customers come back, they come back for the great service. Transtar Industries is a global leader in aftermarket distribution with 45 years of experience offering speedy delivery on transmission, differential, and AC parts through local stocked branches in a national distribution network. Transtar now offers high-quality OE recycled transmissions and transfer cases, a perfect choice for cost-conscious customers. Transtar is continuing to expand product offerings including brakes, electrical, steering, suspension, and more helping you to provide your customers with fast, reliable service. Transtar parts are available for online ordering through transcend.us or right through your shop management system. Ordering with Transtar has never been easier. You can feel confident Continental is the smart choice in tires. And the handle extremes? Anything for the guy who finds that one pothole. Were they made by like a bajillion engineers? Yeah. Really? 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 Really. Welcome to the smart choice in tires.
With everything lasting longer on today's cars, including your oil, your spark plugs, and your fluid change intervals, it can be misleading that you don't need to check these as often as you think, which is not true. There used to be a time that back in the 40s and 50s, everybody would check their oil, check their fluids when they're at the gas station. When was the last time you saw anyone checking their fluid levels at a gas station? Probably been a while. It's usually just pump and go. Last shop that I remember was Pruitt's Automotive down in Louisville, Kentucky that still do the full service deal for you when you pull in. But those days are mostly gone. So that leaves it up to you to be able to check your fluids. And especially on a long road trip, it's really important to be able to check your fluids. Checking your oil, power steering, brake fluid, washer fluid as well, and your coolant and topping off as needed. One thing to always remember about checking your coolant though is to never open this when it's hot. Why? You've probably seen countless images of steam pouring out of cars. Well, why does that happen like that? And why is it bad to open this? Well, this pressure cap right here puts 15 pounds of pressure on my cooling system. And that raises the boiling point 45 degrees. So no longer are we boiling at 212. We're boiling at what, uh, 212 plus 45, you know, 257. But the second you open this on a hot engine, all that pressure is now atmospheric pressure. It's all gone, instantly boils. And that's where it's gonna scald you or burn you if you open this when it's hot. Most of your reservoirs are clear, so you can see the level without opening this. If you can't see that, wait till it's cool. If you are a little low on oil, make sure you use a, the same oil that is designed for your engine. Especially important for variable valve timing engines where the oil viscosity could actually cause you problems if you use the wrong one. I'm gonna make sure all these fluid levels are good before we hit the road again. Take a look at the level of the oil in this one right now. Here's my max, here's my min. I'm still safely in between. I'm maybe down a quarter of a quart right now. Nothing to be too alarmed with. Now, if I was below that min level, way down here, you wanna bring your oil up, add as much as you need, which typically, from min to max, typically is around a quart but I'm okay, I'm within the thatched areas for oil, so we don't need to add any. Now, what would cause my oil to disappear? Why would I get lower? Well, you could have a leak, or you could have a problem with burning it. If you're not sure, ask your local shop. They'll help you out. One other bit of warning I'll give you is when you're checking your brake fluid, Typically, you shouldn't need to top this off. If you develop a leak, of course you're gonna to wanna to add some brake fluid to your reservoir. But if you're not leaking and it's just a little low, it's not recommended to top off brake fluid. Most people don't know that. And the reason is because the reservoir, it'll go down as your pads start to get thinner and thinner, your brake pads. That's to allow the piston inside the caliper more area because it's gonna to have to go farther now to squeeze than it did before because now you've got thinner brake pads. If you have um, low brake fluid, but you don't have a leak, you probably wanna get a good brake inspection to see what's going on. Probably your time for brake pads. Checking today's transmission fluid levels can be a bit of a challenge as some do not have dipsticks anymore or they're capped off, meaning you're gonna to have to have a professional take a look at it for you. Also, it may indicate on the dipstick how to check the fluid level. Some dipsticks will tell you, keep the car running in neutral. That's typically on your rear wheel drive cars um, to be able to check it. 
This one doesn't say anything, so I'd have to consult the owner's manual or a service manual on the procedures to check this transmission fluid level. But Transstar just put a brand new transmission in this. I'm just making sure fluid level is good and it looks like we're right on the money. Just because you have a newer car, don't assume the fluid levels are okay, especially on a real long trip, just like we did on the Lincoln Highway. And hey, if you're not sure on how to check your fluid levels, that's what the aftermarket is here for. They'll gladly show you exactly where everything is and how to do it. Let's get back on the road. We are MPA, Motor Car Parts of America, a global manufacturer of light and heavy duty rotating electric, brake parts, wheel hubs and bearings, turbochargers and electrical component testing. MPA, the global leader for parts and solutions. United Motor Products has been manufacturing and delivering OEM replacement engine management products for 35 years. Trusted by installers for over three decades, you can be sure United Motor Products produces and delivers the quality products you can trust. Visit unitedmotorproducts.com. Hardworking hands need a hardworking shop towel. Tough on everything from heavy metals and grease to tar and adhesives, Gojo scrubbing towels can be used anywhere heavy-duty hand and surface cleaning is required without water even on the road to Apex. Driving down what kind of is the Lincoln Highway, I-80 has replaced the original Lincoln Highway. Now the Lincoln Highway, you still can get over there and drive it. It's a little bit trickier over here than in some parts of the states that we've been to, but standing at 48 and a half feet tall, Lincoln is hard to miss as he's kind of watching over the travelers that are traveling the highway right now. This was commissioned in 1959 for Abraham Lincoln's 150th birthday. Now, originally, when this was completed, it was on the old part of Lincoln Highway. It wasn't moved until 1969 once they finished I-80 and put them here along with the rest stop where you can come over and check it out. It's an impressive sculpture. It's worth stopping by. And not only that, we also have the monument to Henry Joy as well. So at 8,858 feet in elevation, technically right now is the highest point of the Lincoln Highway as it stands today. Now, just over the ridge back there is where the original Lincoln Highway used to run through. That actual elevation is a little higher than here. You could still travel it. It's not as easy on that part as it is on a lot of the other places that we've been to on the Lincoln Highway, but you still can do it. But right behind me though is another reason we had to stop by was for the Henry Joy Memorial. Originally, this was west but due to vandalism over in rock springs for some reason or another they moved it over here henry joy again the president of packard worked with carl fisher on their idea of the coast to coast rock highway the lincoln highway which established us to be able to go from san francisco to new york it wasn't easy in 1913. heck it's not super easy now but with the help of the lincoln highway association map and today's technology, it's easy to follow along as you're driving it. And it's definitely worth stopping by and paying tribute to the man, the pioneer that saw this happen way back in the day. As we're walking around, I'm checking out the Henry Joy Monument the Lincoln Monument, I see some fine folks taking pictures near the Henry Joy and Lincoln Highway sign. And as it turns out, they might not be following Lincoln Highway what we are, but they've been coming here for a long time. And I found out that Lynn actually works for the fourth grandson of Henry Joy himself. That is very neat to see a kind of a tie into the original Lincoln Highway on the Lincoln Highway. So. Uh, <laughs> 
Yeah, she works for him. Um, actually, Henry Joy Jr. started the business um, of just handling the finances and needs of clients, mainly family to start with. And, you know, most of the family was involved in that. And through the years, it changed hands. But the Joy family remained clients and became the Macmillan office eventually. And so, you know, we through the years, we had the clients and the children and grandchildren. And now I actually have Henry and his sister Lauren, our client. Remember, no, they're still. It's a far away from the Packard company, but that, yeah, we're yeah. managing the estates of all the children. Right, we yeah. don't want well, now all of their estates and their finance trust. Yeah. That is unbelievable to see that connection here on the Lincoln Highway. Now, you guys all have been coming here, you guys said, from the 50s and 60s, so you have seen a lot of change because. Yeah, this wasn't here when we first started coming. Yeah, yeah, and, and that was over there. Right. Along with Lincoln Highway, right? Yeah, and so and then they came through with uh, I-80 and like 1969 or something, and it and it changed quite a bit, right? Yeah, well, actually, yeah. our main, main road was Highway 30, you know, go through all the farm land and the farm, you know, the villages and so forth. And this, when they built this, boy, yeah, big difference. Yeah, got us it faster. Yeah, yeah, but is, is faster better? When, not necessarily. Not necessarily. We still like 30. We'll take it sometimes and run part of it. The town, the diners, the, you know, it's different. The ice is tasty. Yeah, the ice is <laughs> Yeah, and I think I think that's what gets lost now is today's busy world, including Route 66. They did the same thing where you bypassed it to get somewhere faster. Right. I still kind of think that sometimes the destination is the journey. You know, it's the, it's getting there. Well, here, we leave the highway sometimes to go into the town. Oh, there's better food on the Lincoln Highway than there is on the... <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's not your commercial stuff. In, right. The small towns and the uh, restaurants, and that, uh, well, we've been doing that, as we said, for years. Oh, ever since. I was three. You were these dark. Cold. Oh, right. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> of course, time. And we came every year. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Hey, a lot of fun here on the Lincoln Highway. days of motoring wasn't very glamorous, to say the least. You had cars that were open to the elements. Maybe you had a top, maybe you didn't. Most of the time you were wearing goggles, multiple changes of clothing as well, as you traveled. The Lincoln Highway was right there. And on your travel at that time, think of maybe Beverly Hillbilly's granny's car all loaded up, and you remember that scene? That is Black Bull. Texas tea. Watch your hair, Granny. That's what it was like then. You had supplies, provisions, different parts, anything you could carry. Sleeping arrangements were all very, very important as well. You were traveling adverse conditions, which means you needed tools to help dig yourself out. It wasn't glamorous to travel in the early going of automobile history. Your sleeping quarters at night was going to be a field. Maybe you had a farmer that was kind enough to let you stay in their field or maybe their barn and provide you a sandwich in the next morning on your travels west. So a place like the early auto camps that started springing up in the 1920s would have been a much welcome sight to any weary traveler on the Lincoln Highway. This is what we would call a auto camp, a precursor to the motels that today even seem old, but these were really what started the traveling and being able to stay somewhere. Now, something like this cabin for a dollar, you were able to bring your car in and actually, which was really incredible for the time, they gave you your own garage. So you could put your car in the garage, keep it out of the elements. Now that was really important for the motorists who didn't have the newest and latest and greatest cars, 
who had an open top, who had an exposed sides, they didn't have windows. So a great place to at least keep your car, keep it out of the elements for at least one night, and you can find yourself in your own cabin. I say cabin, cabin is a nice word. These are very sparse. You were lucky to have a light bulb. Not much in there, no amenities. So you still were bringing all of your stuff in with you, but it was slightly better than a tent. It was much better than sleeping on the ground. And at least you were out of the elements. And that was for a dollar. No bathroom in your cabin. Your bathroom was way down there as a part of the shared community of everybody that would be here. And I hear stories from way back in the day that once everybody was here and parked, it wasn't just one person hiding in their cabin. Most people were sharing what they had, talking about the route they took, maybe explaining not to go this certain way, but to try this another way because they had problems there as well. This is what really spawned the motels that started off in the 1940s and 50s. So you had motor camp. Now you go to a motel. And of course, today we're all used to hotels. As the roads improved, these are just relics now of a time that used to be on the Lincoln Highway. Now you have much more comfortable accommodations, your own bathroom, maybe not a place to park your car, but a comfortable place to rest your head. And there's plenty of those on the Lincoln Highway. Since 1927, AP Emissions has been your source for complete exhaust innovation. We're your one-stop shop for the exhaust brands you know and the quality you trust. Visit apemissions.com. TYC develops and manufactures the latest state-of-the-art automotive products of the utmost quality. With the latest in engineering and state-of-the-art robotic manufacturing, TYC products are guaranteed to be of the best quality with exceptional performance. Visit TYCAmericas.com to find out more. When the OE part fails, count on the brand with world-class engineering, precision manufacturing, and more than 100 years of experience. When OE fails, trust standard. What's in your box? For the ones who demand the best, there's a Coats machine to get the job done right. Precision that never quits. Toughness that defines legends. Coats. Engineered to perform. Designed to last. Visit CoatsCompany.com to learn more. help but think as I'm driving down the Lincoln Highway right now what it was like in you know 1920 how long did that spark plug last how long did the oil last in those those were really crude you didn't get much out of those products as I drive in a 2002 Lincoln Blackwood think about the change in innovation and technology that's under the hood of this car in just such a short amount of time since the introduction of the automobile. These spark plugs are gonna last 100,000 miles. My oil is gonna last 7,500 miles on synthetic that I'm running. You know, those are big changes in the way that technology has advanced. The innovations you're seeing makes maintenance on a car a lot easier and much more affordable than it was a long time ago to own something that broke pretty frequently. David, I know you've got a lot on this subject. I'm gonna let you take a crack at it. In the automotive aftermarket, there's perhaps no better survival tactic than innovation. Look around the Apex show floor this year. It's everywhere. New companies, new products, new solutions to new problems, it's all par for the course every year. 
Innovation in the automotive aftermarket is the lifeblood for adapting to changing industry dynamics, meeting customer demands, staying competitive, and addressing emerging challenges like compliance, globalization, and environmental responsibilities. Companies that embrace innovation are better positioned to thrive in a rapidly evolving automotive landscape. I want to get a deeper understanding of what innovation actually looks like. Real, tangible examples in the aftermarket. That brought me first to Sissonville, West Virginia, the day of a campus expansion for Niterra, the manufacturer of NGK spark plugs. Obviously, this expansion is a sign of prosperity in this business, but what does that look like when it comes to a component that you might not think needs too much innovation anymore? The spark plug. Well, Michael Schwab, Niterra's president and CEO, has some ideas. That's a big subject, uh, but Arc, I would, you know, in many ways, we've we've innovated in the spark plug space, you know, going back to 1936. But I would say over the last couple of decades, where the the bulk of that innovation has come uh, through the application of precious metals, and where we really stand out is our ability to bond precious metals to uh, various types of ceramic. And so precious metals just have allowed, uh, you know, the spark plug manufactured product to become so much more efficient. I would say the biggest innovation has been through the application and the bonding of precious metal onto spark plug. And why is it important to continue to innovate the spark plug? Any company, whether it's our company or any other, uh, it's really important to continue to innovate, uh, you know, to be creative and to, to always trying to improve uh, creating new solutions, becoming more efficient, whatever the case may be. In our position as the number one manufacturer of spark plugs in the world, uh, it's really an expectation. And so we've got this, this sort of insatiable appetite uh, to improve what we do in spark plug technologies for many different types of applications, you know, from, from small engine to, uh, you know, you name it, industrial generators. We are constantly trying to innovate and improve uh, our products and uh, helping our customers and helping engines become more efficient. Now, in my mind, one of the biggest changes coming down the pipeline that will necessitate innovation from companies like Niterra is that big electrified elephant in the room. How does this company evolve as more EVs find a place on our roads in the coming decades? Well, there's no doubt EVs are coming. Uh, EVs are, are being worked on and being developed by all of the largest uh, engine makers around the, around the world, the car makers. And you know we've got very strong partnerships we've developed over many decades with the largest OEMs in the world. And it's through those partnerships, those collaborative partnerships, that we continue to partner with them as they develop you know various EV technologies. From West Virginia, my innovation investigation brought me westward to Indianapolis, Indiana, to investigate how another staple of the industry is evolving to meet and exceed customer expectations, engine oil. And for those answers, I had a specific company on my radar, DA Lubricant Company. The lubricants industry is a highly competitive one with plenty of players competing to innovate. It takes a company willing to constantly invest in research, development, and technology to meet the changing needs of the automotive and industrial sectors. I sat down with John Knoll, the company's executive vice president, and Scott King, the Indianapolis plant's production manager, to get the lowdown on what it takes. Well, it's, it's a combination of things. So, you know, making an engine oil is like baking a cake. You've got a lot of different components. They all interact with one another. So it's the selection of the different base oils that uh, we have to give you the oxidation protection, but the wear, uh, additional wear protection. We've got to select the right additives that will allow us to get the anti-wear protection, but at the same time, not come through the emission system and poison the catalyst. So it's very much a balancing act of, if I add a little bit of this, and a little bit of this, do they work together or do they work opposed to one another? So the innovation really comes in in the selection of the technologies that go together to deliver the overall performance. So of course, um, the innovation is fantastic, but it doesn't mean anything if you can't produce the product and ship it out to your customers. Um, I know that you've uh, recently done a lot of different upgrades to your factory. Can you kind of give me a little bit of an explanation as to what those upgrades were, what the meaning of those were, how did that increase your efficiency, things of that nature. 
Within the facility, we've, we've added some new technology. Uh, we've added, um, it's called a capper, and we use that for our mining tins to place the cap in the bung. Uh, instead of doing that manually with a rubber mallet and placing it and hitting it, actually the machine will set it, place it, and push it in to, uh, the, to the mining tin. And then uh, we're in the process of putting a new uh, drum filler line in. Uh, currently today we can do somewhere in the neighborhood of two to 250 drums per day, filling them, 55 gallon drums and also some quarter drums. Uh, but with the new drum line we'll be able to encroach you know, 400 to 500 a day. I spoke about electric vehicles with John and Scott too. What is the role of a lubricants company in the era of EV? EV is going to continue to grow. Um, but today the car park in the U.S. is about 12.2, 12.5 years. So over the next decade, the next 20 years, um, internal combustion engines are going to be a major part of the market. Um, that car park is not going away anytime soon. The balance we have as manufacturers is to continue to develop technology for the internal combustion engines to make sure that we can meet the demands that we talked about on fuel economy, um, emissions, engine performance, and the same thing on the EV side of uh, meeting the needs um, for imp improved EV vehicle fluids. The real challenge will be is balancing the, the development of both products, pro both product lines. Um, additionally, um, you know, we have the, to face the continual decline of the, the automotive PCMO market. PCMO engine oils are declining. It's not going to be short term, it's not going to be because of EV vehicles, it's going to be because of extended drains. As we have more of the oil change indicator lights, people following those directions, you're seeing oil changes go from 3,000 miles to four to five to, um, to 8,000 miles and so forth. So oil change drain intervals are going to have a bigger impact on the overall demand for engine oils in the next 10 years than EV vehicles alone. Lastly, on my innovation journey, I headed up to the Northeast to Long Island to speak with two of the marketing gurus at Standard Motor Products, Aaron Schaefer, Director of Marketing Services, and John Herc, Vice President of Marketing for SMP's Vehicle Control Division. SMP is known in this industry for manufacturing all kinds of different part numbers for just about every make and model you can imagine. I wanted to know how a company can possibly balance that kind of quantity while producing the quality their customers can expect. You're exactly right. We do offer a lot of parts. I think we're approaching 70,000 individual part numbers. Uh, spread out across multiple brands, which uh, can be a difficult task to manage. But what I would say is it starts with the people, the dedication of the people, the culture that's been created here at Standard Motor Products and continues to carry on. Everybody's dedicated to their individual responsibilities. And we all tend to function, remove as many silos as we can and function in a collaborative way to make sure that when we're developing product, we make sure engineering knows about it. When engineering knows about it, they ensure that the production folks know about it. It. Now the nice part is, is we're spread out pretty wide. We have production and manufacturing capabilities in Mexico, we're in Europe, we're here in North America. When we do go overseas, if we do do things in Asia, we tend to do it as a JV, so now we actually become the primary focus. Again, partnered and collaborated. And when you do this basic manufacturing or supplement with a joint venture, you actually control the quantity of parts you manufacture, the quality of your parts that you manufacture, and you also control costing. So it allows us to be the best manufacturer we possibly can and the best supplier to our customers. Being able to control the manufacturing is um, critical to, to maintaining quality control. Uh, and then the other thing that we do, because you're right, we're in so many parts, we have so many different categories, is our company's focus and then ability to assist distribution in managing those, all of those part numbers, I think is, is second to none. Because you're right, you know, there's a category we might have 2,500 part numbers. 
but we don't just say, well, you should have all 2,500 numbers on, on the shelf. Like, that would be silly. Um, but we, we work collaboratively. We have enough data that's coming in at real time that we, we really, it's an overuse cliche, but we really are an active partner with all of our distribution partners in making sure that they're making, we're making the best use of the inventory. And we're doing that across multiple categories. And I think that that's something else that um, I'm, I'm proud of. Innovation is undeniably the driving force moving the automotive aftermarket forward. And it's the aftermarket's ability to innovate that enables it to address any and all new changes or bumps in the road that might be coming over the next decade and further into the future. The ability to adapt, create new solutions, and constantly improve is what keeps the aftermarket and even the automotive industry as a whole thriving. Aftermarket Armor introduces a bed liner that has a four hour pot life, which is twice as long as the competition, giving you the needed time to complete the job. A proprietary formulated product giving you the best UV resistance, protecting your vehicle from sun fade for years to come. Find out more at aftermarketarmor.com. Aishin is a trusted and reliable source for high quality aftermarket automotive components and technology. We redefine mobility through our broad range of technologies and product lines. At Aishin, we are poised to embrace the future, inspiring movement, and creating tomorrow. At 1-800-EVERY-RIM OEM Wheels with a massive inventory, we buy and sell reconditioned, new takeoff, and used OEM replacement wheels, all backed by over 150 years of combined experience. Text pictures to 951-RIM-TEXT or visit us online at 1-800-EVERY-RIM.COM. The entire weight of today's vehicle is supported on a surface smaller than a credit card inside the wheel hub assembly. With so much riding on it, why would you use something other than OE quality replacement parts? OE quality, premium product. BCA bearings by NTN. Next time on Road to Apex. Now I'm finally at the Bonneville Salt Flats. This is where the aftermarket said, as soon as we can make a car, let's make it go faster. Wide open, miles. Something crash landed close to the Blackwood. Looks like there might be another one we've got to worry about. We're here at Geotech to speak about what telematics is and what its promise is for the future.